Hey y'all, I'm James Wright, and welcome to the shop. Today we are finishing up the dining room table build, building two of them. Yeah, I'm actually gonna finish a project. Surprise, surprise. Last time on Wood by Wright, making two dining room tables out of red oak. <gasps> yes, red oak. Okay, yeah, sorry. Uh, last time we cut all the pieces and basically sized everything up, and now we can actually start doing the joinery. And a lot of people will tell you, you know, the joinery, that's where all the work is at, and it is where all the fun work is at, but honestly, joinery is, is not that big of it. Uh, the joinery is actually um, a smaller portion of this whole build. It, in this case, it's a very simple shaker style, so there isn't a whole lot to it. And for most projects, the joinery really isn't the biggest part of it. It's all of the other little things of getting things ready and the finishing and all the prepping. But in this case, we're just cutting standard tenons and all eight stretchers are getting this same standard tenon on them. I'm gonna use a tenon saw to cut the cheeks down. Yes, a tenon saw to cut tenons. And then once we get down close to the line, we're gonna rotate it and then I'm gonna use the sash saw to cut in the shoulder. So if you imagine this tenon pointing up, the head is the top and so we're trimming the cheek and then the small bit going vertical at this moment is actually the shoulder. And so we're gonna trim it all, make sure it's nice and clean and I can use the side of the chisel to make sure that it's flat across. Now that we've cut two dimensions or, or two sides, we're then going to cut the other two sides. And so in this case, one of them is going to have a very short uh, shoulder and the other one's going to have a little longer shoulder. In this case, I want the longer shoulder to be towards the top of the leg. So there's a little more meat up there. I don't want to make that tiny little bit of meat on top of the shoulder. I want to actually make it a little more structural. So it comes down about an inch and then just enough to, uh, to hide the shoulder for the, uh, the bottom edge of this. So again, we're going to cut down the shoulders with the carcass saw or the sash saw and then cut in the cheeks with the tenon saw. We're going to come back and pare it all down and clean it all up. It takes me about, uh, about uh, two and a half, three hours to cut all of the tenons. So that ends up being 16 tenons total. And then we have to go and cut the mortises. And cutting bigger mortises is often a lot faster and easier than cutting smaller mortises because you can easily auger them out. Uh, a quarter inch wide mortise is not easy or fast because augering out doesn't, doesn't increase the speed at all. Uh, but for these big ones, they do pretty well. I'm using this multi-head uh, marking gauge uh, for all of the mortise markings. And then I have another one that I use for all of the tenon cuttings. And it's kind of nice because I've got all of these heads and I have one marking gauge to do everything for it. If you want to see the video on making this, I have that uh, set up as well. We'll transfer all the marks onto this and every mortise is cut to match that exact tenon. Because I, I could take them all by measurement and hope that they all match. But in reality, I'm not that perfect. And so it's often a little bit better to actually measure them all off of the existing tenons. I'm going to set up one of my augers to then cut out the holes. And because of the size, I only have to drill three holes. They go really quickly. And then I've got this bit on here that stops it just at the right spot. And this way I know that they're all exactly the same length because they're coming in from the two sides. They will meet in the middle and stop. So everything is, is sized up well. If you want to see, I have videos on all of those as well, why I use them and how they're used. And we can chop down and clean out. And I like being able to come in with the auger, especially on these large ones. It just makes it very, very fast and efficient. Uh, each one of these took me uh, 10, 15 minutes or so to, to cut each. I think I spent about two hours total on cutting all of the mortises. Um, so actually a good bit faster than that. They, they, they went very, very smoothly and efficiently. And so I'm gonna leave everything a little ways away from the line and then come back and then trim it right down to the line. And then we can test it and make sure it fits, it slides in, it's exactly what we want. And if it's a little bit too tight, we come back and shave off a little bit more. I want it to require a, a tap from the mallet. I don't want it to just slide right in. Uh, though these will be removable, they're not gonna be glued in place. The legs are designed to come off. And then I can chest, test it with my depth gauge just to make sure everything's cleaned out. And in this case, this one's a little bit tighter than I'd like, but not too bad. Just about That's right. Goes about. down in, nice tight fit. Now, and uh, with a bit of a squeeze, that, a that will pound motion. right in and... Uh, be incredibly tight. So that's how we make uh, one, but then we need to rotate this and cut it in again from the other side. And you can see how it as, uh, doesn't quite make the end, and that's okay because we're actually going to miter them to fit into each other. Speaking of miter, once I find out how long it needs to be, we're going to mark it with a miter gauge, uh, a miter square or an unsquare or a miter square. 
Uh, yeah, there's, they go by a bunch of different names. Uh, <laughs> so you can trim it down and cut off of 45 degrees. This doesn't have to be exactly accurate. There's nothing that these two don't have to perfectly meet inside. Um, so I'm going to move it a little ways away from where it needs to be. And then some of these I realize, oops, I need to do it from the other direction. And then we can come back and trim it off. They don't have to be perfect again. They're going to be hidden inside, and there's really nothing structural about them. Just a little bit more on there gives it a little bit more strength. So I can go through, cut a corner on all these, and then I'm going to fit them into the legs and make sure that they actually fit. Because if one of these is a little longer than the other, they'll run into the other one, and then they'll push the other leg out. Well, so I can slide one in, and then inside. lay it down on the floor, and then try and slide in the other one. Or in this case, I'm going to try and uh, lay it down on the bench, and then realize that the there stretcher is too see. long and runs into the ceiling. Mighty but there, you can see how it comes to a 45 inside the slot. So we can put one in, and slide in the other one, and in this case, they both fit. They come all the way in. Sometimes we'll slide the second one in and realize that it hits the first one, and it kind of bumps it out of place. Now let's actually go into tapering the legs. These are 3 inch by 3 inch legs, uh, and the ends are going to get tapered down to 2 inches. So that means we need to take a half inch off of all legs at the bottom. And I've got several videos actually on how to taper legs. I have a live video where I went into it in more detail. Uh, so if you want to see those, uh, you can pull those up. But it's actually a really fast and easy process. I'll take the scrub plane and I'll just plane it from line to line. I draw a line at the top, I draw a line at the bottom, play, that, connect the dots, and it's done. Uh, it's like uh, five or six minutes per side. Unfortunately, there's seven, four sides seven and eight legs. One, and uh, yeah, that gets expensive really quickly. So now you can see how this all comes together, a, a tenon into either side of the leg. And I'm actually going to be making a corner gusset block. Uh, and this is something I wouldn't normally do because I normally glue it in place. But the uh, the owner wants it to be able to come apart. And I kind of understand that. These are going to be fairly heavy tables, probably around 100, 150 pounds a piece. And uh, trying to work those into the house with legs on them isn't going to work so well. Um, especially with the, the smaller the two tables has, uh, longer legs, it's bar height. And so in that case, um, being able to take the legs off is very valuable. So to make the gussets, I'm going to grab a scrap piece of red oak and cut a 45 on one end, measure it down however long I need it to be. In this case, it's around nine inches long, but there is no special to it. Just something around nine inches to a foot-ish is, is perfectly good. I'll cut a corresponding 45 on the other end, and now this is a gusset that will fit into the corner. We can check and make sure that they are 45. Um, if they're a little bit less of an angle than 45, that's okay. Uh, as long as they're not more, we want them to be able to sit in the corner. Then once I know the shape is right, then we're going to trim it down and uh, bring it to the right height. I want it to be about a quarter inch below the skirt. So if the skirt is four inches, I want this to be about three and three quarter inches. Plane it down smooth, chamfer the corners just a little bit, and uh, then this block is ready to actually drill some holes in. Now you could just run so screws into it, but I find it much better to um, pre-drill all of the holes in the gusset as well as countersink the heads. So they kind of become a pocket screw, except for they're like 45 degrees as opposed to something else. So I'm actually going to use a pocket screw bit. And this one comes in and they just go in until they just touch in a little bit. Gives a shoulder for it to hit in. And because they're a little longer, I'm actually going to run in a bit to uh, countersink them all the way down. And at this point, the table is built. I could put it all together and it would work. But we need to do all of the final finishing touches. And there are lots of final finishing touches. All of the, uh, all of the skirts need to have their edges chamfered. And so we're going to chamfer them all at 45 degrees all the way along the edge. All of the legs are getting a heavy chamfer. The top is getting a heavy chamfer. The bottom of the top is actually getting a, a counter chamfer. So it is um, about a quarter inch deep but it's an inch inside the skirt, and so it's not a 45 degrees, it's at something else. When you're doing the end grain of the table, uh, it's actually easy if you just skew the block plane a little bit. Um, in this case, I ended up going with the regular plane, and then I think I switched to, to the low angle plane, um, just because it was easier to handle at that particular angle, uh, running along it for this, uh, this one that's not 45 degrees. The one that's 45 degrees, the block plane did it perfectly fine. Uh, but in this case, it was uh, not. Actually, you know, I went and used the aluminum plane. It was, it was rare. I, I actually used it because it was lighter. Um, I could handle it easier at that weird angle. And so the aluminum plane actually worked very, very well for that. It would have been a good place if I had a wooden plane to put on it. That would, that would work very well. I want to just go and tell those corners match and touch corner to corner. And that is the edge I'm looking for. 
After doing the final uh, finish scraping, we can now bring out the stain and go to town on it. Wait, stain? Let me check my script. Oh, yeah, I'm putting stain on there. Wow. Um, <laughs> it's not something you see very much on this channel, but I'm making this for friends of mine. And so as it's a commission, uh, they get what they want. And I'm going to be using a, a fairly standard uh, Minwax stain. This one's a little bit different from what I normally use. Um, and I... Uh, I wish that I had gone through and, and pre-treated it, and I may end up going back and uh, um, taking the tables back from them and redoing the tops on because one of them was a little bit more blotchy than I like, which normally I like on oak because I'm trying to bring out the ray fleck, so I usually don't pre-stain oak. Uh, but in this case, this one had an interesting reaction to it, so I may end up going and doing that. Uh, the test sample I had came out great. It was just on one of the tabletops. It's a little larger. You can kind of see a little bit of a, a striping from it that I wasn't uh, quite expecting. So we'll put the stain on there, let it sit overnight. Uh, actually, it was almost 36 hours or so before that, and we're going to coat them with Rubio Monocoat. Now, I could get a Rubio Monocoat that comes uh, fully tinted and would be all one process. I really like that. Um, but in this case, it was much. Uh, it, it was better for them to actually do it in the two steps and have the stain like nice and the finish separate. Ruby Monaco is one of my favorite. It just goes on. You put it on thick so that everything gets covered. You let it sit for about 15 minutes, and then you come back with a clean rag and you polish and clean it off. And that's that. It is amazing. It is fast. It, there are no VOCs. Uh, it's one coat and it's done. And you have this beautiful matte finish. You, you actually get to feel the wood texture through it. It's not a, uh, a thick finish on there. It's just, it's my absolute favorite. And it feels so good to the touch. Um, it is a very, very pleasing finish. And as long as the, the stain is fully cured, it goes on very nicely and covers it all up. Once all of the finish has been applied, we can let them sit. And with Rubio Monocoat, it's only 24 hours and they're ready to go. You'll notice I have these figure eight clips on there. Um, I didn't shoot video of putting those on. I completely forgot about it as I kind of got into the moment. Uh, but that's how I'm going to be attaching at the top. Um, it's either figure eight clips or pocket screws for my um, use. Um, I don't like wooden clips as much. And uh, there's, a, there's a bunch of ways of doing it. But those are figure eight clips are, are generally my favorite. So I'm going to put it all together, clamp them in place, and the clamps are to hold them tight uh, while I'm getting everything in place because the tenons can move around a little bit. I'm going to set the stretchers right where they need to be and then put in the figure eight clips. And then we can put in the corner gussets. I have uh, pocket hole screws that are going to go through at an angle, and they go into the stud and the skirt, and then we're going to be putting in a lag screw, a quarter inch lag screw through the leg, and that's what sug snugs it all up. This bolt is what gives it all strength without the glue. And so with that in place, the tables are done. We can flip them over and try them out. You can see how one is taller than the other and larger so that the shorter and longer table can actually slide underneath it. So you can have a long extension table or a couple different, and they actually are getting chairs that are going to be at different heights. So it's kind of fun to give it, uh, different ways to put them out for different situations of the family. And I really kind of like how they came out. An interesting project I would not have done on my own, but that's what friends are for. <laughs> Those two tables were a lot of fun. I kind of like how they nest together so you can have them taking up less space or pull them apart or split them around and you can set them up to however you want. Adults table, kids table, however you like it. Uh, it was really kind of a, a fun idea and uh, they're friends of mine who I made those for. Um, so yeah, I didn't make them exactly the way I want. I generally wouldn't want to stain it, but they liked it and it fits very well into their kitchen and their environment. So uh, yeah, I'll do what the, uh, what the customer wants. In a few weeks, we'll probably have a video coming out putting the whole thing into one big compilation. Um, but if you want to see the first build where we actually went through and did a lot of the, the basic stuff, I'll leave a link to that down below. I hope you did like this. It was kind of a fun one and sometimes it's nice to do things that aren't exactly for you, they're for someone else, and it kind of stretches you in different directions. This one is a very simple, standard, basic table build, but yet there's still different things to learn, different things to try, and new things you can play with. So I hope you like it. If you have any questions, thoughts, ideas, let me know those down below. I do read through all of them, and I answer all of them I can get to. So if you have any thoughts that I need, uh, let me know. Also, that does help out the channel. Anytime you comment down below, or you can just comment down below. Thank you, that does help us. As well as the like, share, subscribe, Thank you. They get us in front of more people, help the channel to grow, and it's just really all around a good thing. If you want to take it one step farther and be more than just a good thing, but be a great thing, there's a bunch of people scrolling over here. They are the patrons on Patreon, and without patrons and members, we wouldn't exist. We are completely sponsored by you, the viewer. If you'd like to find out more about Patreon, there are links down below, or click the little join button and become a member here on YouTube. We do offer special perks for both patrons and members. We're going to be having a hangout here in a couple days, so thank you for that. That does really help us out, and until next time, have a wonderful day.
The fun thing about finishing a table build is that it's one of those subjects you can finally table. <laughs>